Lawler's uh, algorithm and uh, sequencing, and we have now found the position on three of the jobs. Start with the last job in the sequence, and then the second last, the third last, and so on, and take one step forward every time. Select one job at a time, according to which jobs are available when you look at the precedence diagram. And we have now found the position for job number five, three, and six, and we need to determine the position of the three remaining jobs. And then look at the make span of the remaining jobs, which now will be, it used to be nine, and now we have selected job number uh, six, which has, uh, which has, uh, has a processing time of uh, one. Then we have the remaining jobs will take eight days to finalize. Job number one, two, and four. A total of eight <coughs> days. So, according to the precedence diagram, which jobs are now available to be last among the sequence of the three remaining jobs? Well, job number four is one option, and job number two is the second option. We cannot choose job number one because it needs to be performed before number two. So then the candidates will be either job number two or job number four. And the tardiness of these two jobs on that position will be job number two. It will be the tau value of eight minus the due date of three. Uh, no, the due date of, uh, of six. And job number four, eight minus the due date of seven. Here. This is two and this is one. Which means choose job number four, which has the lowest tardiness among the two possible candidates. And job number four will be at this position. And then it should be pretty easy to find the sequence of the two remaining jobs because job number one needs to be performed before number two. So this is now the sequence using Lawler's algorithm and sequencing on jobs when they have precedence constraints. Start with the last job and find the uh, and, and uh, compare the possible alternatives and choose the job with the lowest tardiness at each possible position. So let's now look at this sequence and find the, the relevant measures for, for this. The flow time here will be two, five, and job number four will take three more days. Job number six, one more day. Job number three. And job number five. This is the flow time. And these numbers can also be recognized as the tau values for the different uh, uh, steps here. The make span of the remaining jobs for each decision. And also look at the tardiness here. Then and then it should be finished by job number uh, as a due date of yeah, job number four of course. This one, seven compared to eight will be one. Job number six, nine compared to seven, and job number three and job number five at last. So this will now be the tardiness of the different jobs. Look at the number of the job here and compare to the due date for each possible job. In total, the flow time, the sum of the flow time will be 52. And the sum of the tardiness will here be 11. 
and we can also look at the measures here, the mean flow time will be 52 divided by 6, which is 8.7. We have the average tardiness, which is 11 divided by 6, 1.8. And the uh, number of tardy jobs, 1, 2, 3, 4. And the max tardiness will here be 4. Two jobs are 4 days late. And if we remember the first come, first serve sequence on the same example, we had the values 9.5 on the mean flow time, 2.67 on average tardiness, maximum tardiness was 8, uh, was 8 compared to 4. But the num number of tardy jobs was only three. Uh, but here we have four tardy jobs. So we have more jobs that are delayed, but the delay are much smaller. So according to if, if this is the most important constraints, uh, uh, constraint uh, or the objective, then this uh, sequence formed by Lawler's algorithm should be a better sequence uh, than the one, two, three, four, five, six, the first come, first serve sequence. So this is uh, the way to solve such problems when you have precedents that you can use Lawler's algorithm and select one job at a time from the last job and take one step forward each time. Okay, I have one more example on this. I will not present it on the lecture, but it is uploaded. The solution is uploaded on uh, Fronter. This is uh, Example or problem 8.7 in the textbook for page 435, which might be a fam familiar problem for some of you that you have students, this time a lazy student, who have lots of different assignments and dif in different courses with different due dates and needs to find a way to prioritize and, uh, and to, uh, to sequence these jobs according to different uh, constraints on, uh, on precedence that some assignments need to be completed before the others and it's not possible to meet all the due dates but here in this example at least it is possible to, to deliver uh, late. So this, the solution for this problem is uh, uploaded in front of Of course you should study it and try to understand it and if you have questions you should just contact me or send me an email or come, come to my office. And that was the last part of the curriculum. Then we are finished. Remaining time, I will focus on uh, uh, exam problems. In particular, last year's exam. Uh, the curriculum is uh, the same for you, and uh, uh, the exam, well, the structure of the exam will also be uh, quite similar. So, I think we might need some space. So this is the exam for uh, last year, 2012. Your exam date will be December the 9th, uh, a Monday. And you will also have five hours from 9 to 14, 9 to 2 o'clock. Uh, supporting materials will also be the same, all written and printed aids in addition to a calculator. So you are able to bring your textbook, your notes, solutions for exams, uh, earlier exams, and uh, 
uh, and assignments. Uh, but what is very important is that you should organize your notes, you should know where you can find things. There will, for most of you, be a well, shortage of, of time. Five hours is not much to solve the, all the problems in the exam. And if you don't know where to find the different parts, what you are looking for, then it will be uh, not, not too much time to, to look through and, and, and try to find things which you are, if you don't know exactly what you are looking for. So, uh, also there will be two versions, one English version and one Norwegian version, and it's up to you which language you, you answer, answer on. Even if the, the course, the lectures and the materials have been in English, it is possible to answer in, in Norwegian for, for Norwegian students. And uh, this is not a well uh, exam on, on language, so if you well mix up the language, it doesn't really matter because so lots of the terms we have used are English terms, which also should be possible to use in innovation. What is important is that when you write, you try to explain things so I and potential other sensors should be able to understand what you are doing. Also, write formulas. Try to explain what you are doing. If you are showing what you actually are doing and doing a small mistake, you won't. You, you will still get some, some credit for, for that. Because if you are thinking correctly, but it's very easy to make a small calculation wrong, for example. But if you are thinking and trying to solve it correctly, you will gain some, some credit for that, even if you are not solving the, the problem exactly correctly. Also, show formulas, show that you know which formulas to use, even if you are not, you are not able to or not, don't get enough time to finalize all the calculations. Some general advice here will also, of course, be uh, relevant for you. Read through the complete problem text before you start to answer. Very important, try to get a full overview of the problem, what is asked for, different sub-problems, and then try to answer the sub-problems as good as possible. All sub-problems will count equally for the final grade of the exam, which means if there are 20 sub-problems, which is quite common, then each of these problems will count for 5% each on the exam. And of course, you have 10% of the grade from your assignment. So the exam will count for a total of 80% uh, percent for the, the final grade. Uh, but on the exam, uh, it's better to answer many problems partial than only a few perfect. Because if each of the sub-problems will count for 5% each, to, to get two, three points, for example, it's not necessary to solve it correctly, but to show that you are thinking correctly, you know which formulas to use, and so on, so you will get some, some credit for that. So, some of the pr sub-problems might be quite easy, some of them might be difficult, time-consuming, and try to solve, well, easy problems first, and, uh, and try to, to schedule out a solution also on the sub-problem. And even if you are not able to solve everyone, uh, every problem uh, perfect, you should try to write something to show that you, you know, uh, you know the, the problem and you know, well, at least you have an idea on how, how you should try to solve that problem, if you had had enough time. Also, rough sheets will not be graded and should not be handed in with your paper. You need to write everything on the uh, exam examination uh, papers, which uh, also have some carbon uh, copies. Uh, yeah, on the exam day, uh, Monday, the 9th of uh, December, I will come to the room where we are sitting and will be able to answer questions about clarifying the problems, but I, of course I will not tell you whether you are right or wrong or uh, how you should answer the questions. You need to determine that yourself. But, but if you think that the questions are a bit unclear and something needs to be clarified, it is possible to, uh, to ask me. But of course I will not tell you the answer or tell you whether an answer is wrong or not. Uh, probably I will come two times, around 10 o'clock and around 12.30. Okay, let's now have a look at this exam, last year, 2012. And first problem is about scheduling. The part 
which we have now presented the last few uh, lectures, uh, which is not uh, a part of your assignment. So you need to do your well, try to solve problems, uh, find find problems, and try to to read this by by yourself. But here first, problem one about scheduling, theoretical questions, and. Uh, as mentioned, each sub-problem will count equally if it doesn't state anything else. Uh, so then it's uh, also important to try to answer the theoretical questions, like the, the first one, as good as possible. And here you're asked about explain shortly the different rules and also for which objective each of the following rules is optimal. And then you have a particular problem here on the scheduling. I uh, will come back to the details. I will just show the topic of the sub-problems, which not necessarily will be exactly the same for you, but at least here you will get an idea on how the exam is built up. Problem one about scheduling. Here you have a forecasting problem, toy manufacturer producing radio-controlled model cars, and they have introduced this uh, type to the market and got the sales for the two years shown here. And here we can quite easily see that this well, probably a typical Christmas present because it will have a very high increase in the sales in the last quarter here. So here you are asked about forecasting. And here triple exponential smoothing. Uh, so try to use these uh, values here and try to make a forecast for this product and answer the different sub-problem here. First three sub-problems are regarding this uh, forecasting and then there is a continuation on this problem because now the same problem is used as basic information for an aggregate planning problem. Because now you should use the forecast to determine the number of workers needed on this production line by analyzing production from last year. And then you have the forecast, use the forecast from C, and try to determine, well, yeah, first here, calculate the K factor based on the historical data, and then try to determine the number of workers and create a constant workforce schedule for production. And also here, an, uh, a question about linear programming. And even if you are not able to use lingo and solve these types of problems to optimality, you should be able to create a formulation for the aggregate planning problem, an LP, linear programming formulation, which can be used in a solver like uh, lingo. So, Try to write it either in mathematical symbols or eventually write it like a lingo program. Uh, problem number three. Here we have a constant demand, fixed demand for two different items. Uh, and you're asked about the optimal order size. Use the EOQ formula. Find cycle times, how many orders and so on. Ordering and holding cost. And then you are asked about, uh, in, in this case, you are asked about uh, a combined order of item number one and two. But then they need to order exactly twice a year. And the question is, do you recommend the company to accept the offer and buy both items from the same vendor? So you need to calculate the costs in different options and make a conclusion based on uh, on the cost. And also here you will continue on, on this uh, topic, item number two, reduce the price discount if the number of units are exceeding 3000 in an order. So what is the optimal order size for that option? This is a incremental quantity discount uh, and you need to to find the optimal order size for this particular option. And then, based on the total cost, do you recommend to buy items separately, first solution, with the given discount on item number two, which is 
shown here, or to buy both discount here, or to buy both items from the same vendor without uh, discounts. So compare different options, compare the costs for different options, and try to find out which is the best alternative. Then problem number four about lot size reorder point models used in situation with uncertain demand. These models will find the optimal combination of the lot size and the reorder point by solving two functions to determine values for the variables. First, a theoretical question. Explain the different components that are added together in the cost function. And here you have the brackets showing the components. You should now identify in the cost function what does this mean, what does this mean, this and this. And also answer theoretically here, what is the relation between the cost function and these two functions for calculating the Q and R values. <coughs> and then on problem four, continue, find the optimal combination, then use cost function and the two formulas here to find the optimal combination of Q and R when you have the given values here. And at last, what is the probability that no stockout will occur in the lead time with this policy? Also, well, the appendix here, table for the normal distribution. Of course, you are also able to bring your textbook so you can find that this is, this is a copy of the normal distribution at the end of, uh, <coughs> in the end of the textbook. Only some, some particular part of the normal distribution which is relevant for your questions here. Okay, so now you should know about well how this uh, well, how is the exam built up. And uh, as mentioned, this will be uh, well, the structure will be the same. The exact topic might be similar. You will of course get the questions about uh, about uh, scheduling. You will have questions about uh, uh, forecasting. In some way, you need to use the EOQ formula and find the optimal order size. There might be lot sizing problems. There might be uh, well, all types of problems which we have seen in the curriculum in, uh, in this course. So you should be able to answer as much as possible on these types of problems. So now let's go through the exam here and try to solve each problem as good as possible. I also have the solution file here. Um, which is also uploaded in front of today uh, and uh, the exam from the two previous years 2010 and 11 uh, also the exam problems and uh, the uh, solution files have been uploaded in front of for a while so you should also be able to look at these exams so first look at the scheduling problem First part, it is a theoretical question. Explain shortly, and then I mean shortly, try to be focused what is specific for this problem. Don't write uh, several pages on this because then you will use lots of time, which you might need on, on the later problems. And it should be possible to, to use only a few lines to answer sh shortly what is uh, specific for these uh, algorithms and for which uh, objective they are optimal. Or actually the question is for which objective they are, they are optimal. So that you should be able to identify which objective each of these are, uh, are optimal. Then you have a specific problem about a flight control officer which starts to work at 1500. There have been some delays and you have six flights which needs to be scheduled within the next hour. And the preparation and the departure time are given in the table below here. And this will be a similar problem to what we have just seen on, uh, on, on scheduling problem. But, uh, here we don't have production time or processing time, but we rather have preparation time for flights and we have a given departure time. But here it is possible to use these scheduling techniques on this particular problem, which is not about production, but rather a similar problem in a totally different industry. First of all, 
what objective and strategy would you recommend for this scheduling problem? And here is not a one answer which is correct. There could be arguments for several uh, objectives. Uh, there could be arguments for saying that here we, well, okay, we will accept that some flights are delayed, but we will try to finish uh, as many uh, flights uh, as um, within the due time, and then we have to deal with the few uh, delayed or tardy uh, jobs, the flights which are tardy. Uh, there could be arguments for saying that, okay, that if you have a very small deli delay on several flights, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, so you would rather use an objective which is to minimize the maximum uh, delay, which might get some of the passengers into larger trouble than if they are only a few minutes late. And there could be arguments for other uh, objectives. So you need to choose what uh, one and uh, give reasons. Uh, it's not enough in such a theoretical question to say that I think this is the optimal objective uh, or is the best objective, but you should also give reasons why you think that is the most important one. Then find a sequence of the flight using selected strategies. Show the relevant measures for the, uh, that schedule, measures which we have seen in uh, when, when comparing the different, uh, the, the different sequences. And then on D, instructions are given that the international flight C should have priority before flight A. C and A are the largest jobs according to preparation time here and C should be have priority before A. It is this is the instruction. And also you have some light aircraft F and D and their F should be have priority before D. So now you should use Lawler's algorithm which we just have presented and find a new schedule with these precedence constraints. I think that was the last sub-problem there, so then let's look at the answer. And uh, first of all, go through, explain shortly for which objective each of the rules are optimal. First come, first served, well, it's considered to be a fair strategy. Jobs according to the sequence, but they are not optimal for any other objective than if you can consider the fair part as, as, a, as an objective. Shortest processing time will sort jobs according to the processing time. It will be optimal for the objective of minimizing the average flow time. Finish the small jobs as soon as possible and get them out of the system. And then we have to wait with the longer jobs to the end of the sequence. The earliest due date, sort jobs according to the due date. We, this will find a sequence which will minimize the maximum tardiness, maximum delay, which is the delay of any of the jobs should be as small as possible. So here you might experience that you have several jobs which are delayed, but they are not so, so much delayed as they can be with some of the other strategies. Morse algorithm which was presented uh, earlier today starts with a sequence formed by the EDD strategy and then move the jobs which will cause the delay to the end of the sequence. This means we'll move the largest jobs up to the first delayed job to the end of the sequence. Take them out of the sequence and place them to the end. And then the resulting sequence will have the minimum number of tardy jobs. And at last, Lawler's algorithm, which we just saw, works the same way as the earliest due date strategy. Find a sequence which will minimize the maximum tardiness, but it will also consider the precedence of jobs where some jobs need to be finished before the others can start. So you have a precedence and you need to uh, take that into consideration when you are making up the, the sequence. Okay, let's now look at the problem here. We have this particular sequencing problem to try to schedule six flights which might be, at least some of them might be delayed. First of all, what objective and strategy would you recommend for this scheduling prob 
problem. And as mentioned, there could be arguments for different objectives. And with the times given in the example, well, at least my first impression here was the earliest due date is uh, probably the best one. Uh, I'm not saying that this is the only uh, correct solution. And uh, well, the students on last year's exam, they had different answer here. And uh, uh, if you can argue good for your answer, you will of course get correct for, for that. But you need to give reasons why you think this is the best uh, strategy or the best objective according to uh, on, on this particular problem. So here at least my choice is to use the earliest due date and you can accept a small day on several flights in preference to a larger delay on a few flights which might get may be problematic for the passengers on, on these flights. They might accept a few minutes delay but they will have problems if they will be more uh, delayed. Um, a yeah, small delay will probably be acceptable, it will not uh, affect potential corresponding flights, but there could also be arguments here for using an SPT sequence with which will minimize the average flow time, get the small jobs away and wait with the larger uh, jobs, the larger flights here. Or eventually to accept that some jobs need to be delayed, use more algorithm and minimize the number of delayed jobs. <coughs> And here I have also in this document, I have presented the solution, the sequence for different strategies here. Look, use the processing time, the due time, and then the flow time and the tardiness for these here. With well, the earliest due date, you can see that you will have five of the flights delayed, but the maximum delayed is, well, half an hour, 31 minutes. Using the shortest processing time, you will have the small jobs away first. You will have three jobs delayed and one flight. Well, you have one flight which will be one hour late and another one one hour and 20 minutes late, which might be well, quite a uh, large uh, delay and might be problematic for the passengers. Using Morse algorithm, you will find that four jobs are possible to get in time. Two jobs, in this case, the largest, the international flights, they will be positioned at the end and they will be well, more delayed, not, not as much as with the shortest processing time, but they will be more delayed uh, <coughs> as uh, we saw by using the earliest due date strategy. <coughs> So, problem D. You are now given instructions that the international flight C, priority before A, this precedence, and the light aircraft F, priority before D. And no other uh, precedence here. Which means that we, when using Lawler's algorithm, we first have to find the make span time to finish all the jobs. Um, yeah, was 80. Uh, and then you have to choose which job of these four possible alternatives should be positioned at the end. And you have con candidates A, B, D and E. And you can see that here we should select job number E because this one will have the smallest tardiness among these alternatives. Then continue. We have only three possible jobs left, A, B and D. We have chosen number E, which was an independent job here. So now we should select between these three jobs and find the tardiness of these three jobs when they will be positioned before uh, at the, the second last place before number A. And then we can see that the smallest value here will be job B, the other independent job. <coughs> and then we have two pot uh, possible options left, A and D. 
And we have a tau value, which is now 51, which means that the last job chosen will be finished by time 51. And we can see that job number A will have a delay of 31, and D will have a delay of 36. So then we should choose job number A. And then the next step will be to choose between C and D. And here we can see that job number C will be the next one, because it will be only 8 minutes uh, delayed compared to 18. And then of the two remaining jobs, we know that F has to be processed before D, so we already have the sequ sequencing between these two jobs. So C, A, F, D, B and E would be the sequence as shown. Yeah, uh, not exactly correct, but here is the correct schedule. F, D, C, A, B, E, given processing time, the given due time, flow time shown here, and the tardiness shown here, and show the measures, the values of the measures. We have four different ways to compare the uh, compare the different uh, sequences, or was that a part of the question in this case? No, it was not. It was actually only to use Lawler's algorithm and find a new schedule with the precedence constraint. So you, you are not directly asked to show the, the measures here, so this what we have seen so far will be sufficient to answer this uh, question. But anyway, we can also here look at the measures, the mean flow time, the average tardiness, the number of tardy jobs, and the maximum tardiness, and eventually compared with, compare with other, uh, <coughs> uh, with, with other uh, sequences, or the sequence without precedence like we, we saw before. Okay, that's problem number one. We should have a short look at problem number two before we take the break. As <coughs> mentioned, this is a problem on uh, forecasting. You have a toy manufacturer producing radio-controlled model cars. They started or introduced a new type two years ago. They have the sales here. Typical Christmas present with a very high demand in the fourth qu quarter. And they expect a continued growth of the annual demand. We can also see here that we have if we sum up the values, the total values from year one to year two, you will have a growth. You will have a graph which looks like this. So you will have a trend, an increasing trend during the two years, and the company will expect this trend to continue, continued growth of the annual demand. And since they also experience seasonal differencing, they want to use a forecasting method based on the triple exponential smoothing, which is also, well, which Winter's method is uh, one, or the, the one uh, method we, we have looked to uh, in this course, which is based on triple exponential smoothing. So first, find the initial values of the series, the S0, and the gradient G0. And we remember the S0 is if we now are at this point, time zero, this is the year start of year three, we know that the S0 value will be the value, the end point of the trend line at the current time, this value. The G0 value will be the growth from one period to the next on the trend line. So these are the two values we need to start to make a forecast for the coming uh, periods. And then based on the sales data for the first two years, they have found seasonal factors looking like this. This is given. You could also calculate them yourself, but here in this case, to avoid too much uh, uh, calculations for you on the exam. You are also given the seasonal factors here. 
And so you can see that the fourth quarter will have 2.47% of the average or the, the sales according to looking at only at the trend line. <coughs> and then on B, make a forecast for all quarters of the year number three. So from this point, make a forecast for the full year of three. Uh, quarter one, two, three, and four. And then on C, the demand in the first quarter of year three turned out to be 240. Update the S and the G values and make a new forecast for the remaining three quarters of the year. And you're given values on the smoothing constant should be 20%, 0 0.2. Here, we remember from the forecasting uh, part of this course, use the trend line, make a forecast, which should probably be like this, and then Instead of this value, which we forecasted for the first quarter, you might experience this value, which makes it necessary to adjust the S value and adjust the G value, because the trend line will be different, the end point of the line will be different, since we have experienced a higher sales in the first quarter than we expected according to the forecast. Even if this is much smaller than the trend line, uh, since this is a seasonal product, we have uh, had uh, expected a lower forecast. So when uh, uh, the forecast was lower, so when we, ex uh, we get a higher demand, we need to adjust the values on the forecasting method. So these are the three first questions on this problem, which is regarding forecasting, and then we will continue with aggregate planning. But we take a break, and then I will show the solution for the three first questions here.